Welcome back, troglodytes, to the Troglies Guitar Show. Today we have the Gibson Multivoice 2, one of Gibson's earliest attempts at a Super Strat. Well, these ones, eh, they're not so Super Strat, they're more just Stratocaster-like in their tonalities, as well as their general overall body shape. They later produced more Super Straty-like guitars that we've talked about multiple times. But for this Victory series, it was basically Gibson experimenting with brand new pickups. And they released two different models under this series. There's the Victory Multivoice 10 and the Victory Multivoice 2. You also then have two base models called the Standard and Artist, and the body shape was later used on the Q series basses and guitars. I've done a separate video documenting a 10, but let's do a quick recap here. The Multivoice 10 had three pickups and a five-way pickup switch selector. The names for these pickups were the Magna Plus, which was an iron and magnet loaded coil. There was the super stack in the middle, so despite looking like a single coil pickup, it's actually a stacked humbucker. And then the bridge is called the Magna Plus B. It's the exact same thing as the neck pickup, except for it has 35% more windings, and the coils themselves are actually 20% taller. So it's not just because it's raised higher that it looks like it's closer to the strings, it's because, you know, there's more coil there. And throughout the use of this coil splitting switch and the five-way selector, you could get 10 different sounds out of this. Gibson called this one the fill all the needs and requirements of dedicated guitarist guitars. So is the Multivoice 2 just a stripped down version of the 10 that doesn't have the middle pickup and only has a three-way selector switch? No, you're gonna be wrong if you think that. I thought that for so many years, but now that I've actually had them, done a lot of research, and thankfully had original owner's manuals to go off of, these are completely different. So this neck pickup is what is known as the Velvet Brick. Sometimes nicknames get thrown around and mixed up on different models. Some people say that's what's in a Sonics Les Paul. I happen to have one of those, so we'll compare that on the bench demo of this one. But it is an iron loaded pickup and it uses ceramic magnets within it. But the bridge, remember how they're called the Magna Plus in the 10? This is the Magna 2. Notice, this one does not have adjustable pole pieces, whereas the Multivoice 10s, they did. But the Magna 2 was essentially the Magna Plus B, which means it has those taller coils again, but it's completely magnet loaded. It doesn't have that single iron coil. So why is it called the MV2 and not the MV6? Because clearly, three-way position switch with a coil split means you have six different positions, I don't know. <laughs> it's probably just because it had two pickups. But this one was marketed towards the discerning country player. So this was meant to be like a country western guitar. Whereas the 10 was just supposed to be an all-purpose type thing. So what other differences are there between the two? The headstocks are definitely similar. They have the same branding on them. The truss rod covers will read slightly different due to the models, but they have these small Firebird-esque headstocks. But something that's interesting to note about these is that there's no volute, when everything else that Gibson was making at this time had a volute. The fretboards were also different. The two featured an Indian rosewood fretboard and the 10 featured ebony but they both have binding, they have the fret nibs, and they kind of have tiny microscopic frets. I mean, these are closer to the fretless wonders and the low wide frets that they were using on like Les Pauls at this time, but they have a little bit more height to them. We've already discussed the pickups, but the body shapes are the same. We've got the slight variations in how many positions are on the switch, but still the same master volume, master tone with coil split switch. The bridge and tailpiece are the same on these. We'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. And the bodies and necks of these are Eastern Hard Rock Maple. So essentially it just comes down to the fretboard material and the pickups that are in them. These guys kind of have a special bridge on them as I was alluding to earlier. This is called the Top Adjust. It has nine different positions. Basically, if you take this thing off, you can see there's three holes on each side, so you can like angle your bridge in weird ways to kind of help get better intonation. 
It was a very shortly lived feature. You can find it on many early 80s Gibsons. It wasn't just on this model, but according to the owner's manual, they would come with both brass and nylon saddles and you could choose which one you wanted to install, but this one only has the nylon set. But there's one more mystery behind these guitars that we need to talk about before I throw it on the workbench. And it's on the headstock here. Notice it says Gibson Victory CM. Just as a fun little bonus fact here, the prototypes did not actually have the Victory markings on the headstock, it just said Gibson. And the Multivoice 2 was gonna have a black white coil and double black in the bridge. They ended up doing the white black and black white though. And if we go back to my other video, you'll notice it just says Gibson Victory. Why is it that this one has CM? Is it because only the Multivoice 2 had that? No, because here is a Multivoice 10 that also has the CM branding. Is it because the CMs were Kalamazoo made? Well, that seems to check out here. And it also checks out on this one, but these were made both in Kalamazoo as well as Nashville. But no, that is also not the reason. CM is a great mystery that nobody has been able to solve yet. So if we go back to some of the history I was talking about, well, maybe it means country music because, you know, the MV2, it was designed as a country guitar. But that makes absolutely no sense to have it on the MV10 as it was not described as that. So going through the internet archives, you can see people making stuff up like costs more or chick magnet <laughs> or even custom. Around this time in Gibson history, there were things called CMTs that meant curly maple top. So is this just a shorter abbreviation so people stop confusing it with country music television? No, because this isn't really a curly maple top. But what it most likely means is perhaps ceramic magnets. Since there's different versions of each, it's possible that the CM Victories got completely ceramic magnet pickups instead of the iron loaded in the top. But since nobody's really documented nice ohm readings of all their different ones or pictures of how the pickup was built, it's kind of an unsolved mystery. Unfortunately, I didn't document that for the MV10 that I had last time. And I mean, I don't know enough about pickups to look at them and go, yep, that's that and that. So I won't be able to really help solve that mystery, but I will get us some pickup readings on this one, just in case somebody would like to compare it to theirs. So maybe in a combined effort, we can solve what the CM means, but it's very uncommon to find it on the MV2. Now going through reverb listings, it seems to be fairly common. It's not super rare. But the true rarity here is finding it on a multi-voice 10. When I look through sold listings of these, you never see it. And that was the sole reason why I purchased this one. I'm not going to do a separate review on this one, but it is available for sale as well. Uh, this one, it's kind of got some fret issues. You might want to either refret it or recrown and also has a seam line showing. But I wanted to document the CM on the headstock, but I found this other MV2, which does the same thing, which rendered this video kind of useless. So it's guest starring here. So now that we've learned a little bit about this guitar, let's go ahead, throw it on the bench, tear it apart, and look at what makes it up. All right, we've got it all torn apart here. Now this is interesting. It doesn't surprise me at all but the MV2 and MVX all have the same body routes. So you can see this is routed for that stacked humbucker of the MV10. So really the only defining characteristic between the 10 and two is the different fretboard material. Because if somebody were to mod the guitar and put a middle pickup in and change the truss rod cover, the rosewood fretboard would be the only thing that would be the giveaway. The neck pickup, once again, is the velvet brick. It has a gray lead coming out of it. You can see it has the adjustable pole pieces. It has chrome screws instead of the brass screws of the other Tim Shaw design pickups. And we said we were going to compare it to the Sonics pickup. And here's what one of those looks like. 
So yes, it still has that three adjustment spring thing going on, but this one utilizes like a little brass plate that screws onto the back of it instead of having these separate legs on it. So I think that's just a nickname that was incorrectly given to these pickups based off of this one, or maybe they just changed the names. I really don't know. Then this is the Magna 2 pickup. Once again, same defining characteristics, but it does not have the adjustable pole pieces. And here's where you can see the differences in their coil sizes. Electronic wise, we have our original pots in there. I can't quite get the date codes out, but you can just barely see it's a 1980 something, so that works out. You can see the green coil splitter switches they were using in this era. Kind of similar to what you would find on a Les Paul Artist can also see one like that on my super standard the three-way blade style switch there and you have some orange drop caps in there all right pickup readings in the neck in full coil mode you have about 9.47 k ohms coil split cuts it down to about six bridge position it's much hotter at 11.24 and once again coil split it cuts it down to about 6.7 and just for fun, in the middle position, split is 4.28 K ohms, and without it is 6.34 K ohms. As we were talking about earlier, the top adjust bridge. On the underside here, you can see the three slots in which you can put it on. So you could have it up like that, or in the middle, or in the lowers, or anywhere in between there. Like so. Now there's a lot of different reasons for that. Some people say that they were trying to develop a bridge that could be used for both left-handed and right-handed guitars so they wouldn't actually have to drill them differently. And other advantages include like if you can't get the intonation quite right, you just ran out of room, you could just, you know, move the bridge whichever way you needed it. So many different things for this Rendell Wall creation. The tailpiece is your full weight one with the markers in the middle. You can see it's a pure maple body. This is a three piece one as we talked about earlier. Once again, with a very nice rosewood fretboard. I just cleaned and conditioned this one so it's definitely in good shape. And I really don't see any fret wear here. With the truss rod cover off, you can see it's just a regular Gibson style truss rod. This one doesn't look like it's ever really been touched. Neck thickness, I get a 1.68 inches at the nut and 1.98 inches at the 12th fret. The neck depth is very thin. You have a 0.77 inches at the first, but it definitely beefs up at a 0.96 at the 12th. This can kind of help you visualize that, how it starts off very thin. But as you go up the neck, it gets pretty wide and a little bit more fat. The back sides of these instruments don't really have much going on, but you can see the beautiful maple as well as the three piece maple neck. And these have Gibson branded Schaller tuners that are six on a side. This particular example weighs eight pounds, 11.3 ounces. But let me tell you, that feels a lot heavier than that. Now that we've seen the insides of this guitar, let's finally hear how it sounds.
now that we know how this instrument sounds, let's go ahead and review its condition. This is what I would personally consider a collector's grade Gibson Victory MV2. It's not mint condition, it's not perfect, it's got some light scratches and light nicks and things that we'll go over, but as far as this model goes, usually the ones you find are pretty beat up. So looking over the face of the headstock, you can see there's some minor string chain scratches. You can kind of see how the headstock was built. The seam lines are shown here. It's kind of got a Y carved to it. We'll also see that on the back here, but pretty good shape overall on the face of the headstock. You can see this seam line right there. It's a little bit more visible. You can also see there's a very small ding right here. Rosewood fretboard on this one is in great shape. The frets do show some very minor wear and tear, but nothing too bad on this one. And keep in mind, I'm filming this before the tech bench demo, so I'll definitely have oiled this fretboard and it'll look much smoother then. So the face of the guitar here, you can see some light scratches, but overall it maintains that really nice, you know, display quality look to it. You can see some like scuffing from maybe being on a stand or in its case but no like huge nicks or dings out of this one. And that's kind of why I fell in love with this one. This was another one that came out of that collection in Michigan. It was the first guitar I actually bought to kind of, you know, to get the money flowing. And I thought, hey, I would love to document this model anyways. But it's a three piece body here. You can see it's got some nice figuring in that middle strip. Back of the headstock, you can see how it was constructed as I was talking about earlier. So you've got like a small strip right here, and then it's kind of like a pointy shape right here, the triangular for the main position. And then you've got the part where the tuners are kind of attached to. So it's a multi, multi-pieced headstock here. This one, uh, serial number, it looks like 82101068, made in USA. And that's something else that makes this collector's grade, in my opinion. It's from the more desirable original Kalamazoo runs. It's got the CM stamping and the condition's pretty darn good. The Nashville styled ones, their serial numbers won't go vertically like this. They'll go horizontally and then they'll have the made in USA stamp going horizontally as well. You have a nice slim neck profile on here, as you could see from the readings on our tech bench demo. Uh, Three-piece maple neck, it's looking pretty nice here. You don't really have any major nicks or dings on it. This definitely was not played a lot. Here's something else that I really love about this example, is it's got some nice figuring on the back here. Now you can see there is a few scuffs and light scratches back here, but for the most part, if that's all you have to live with, I mean, this one's not too bad. Finding a cleaner version would not be an easy task. But I just love this back. It looks great with that light red stain. Look around the edges here. Got some light scuffs, but for the most part, once again, good shape. You can see down here where it's been scuffing up against the case or maybe a stand, but you do still have your original diamond posilock strap buttons. They're kind of a cool early to mid 80s feature as well. You also have the other one right there. It's kind of a bad position for a strap button to be, but hey, it kind of works. Now let's view under black light. Under black light here, you can see everything glows the way I would expect to see, including those green knobs there. There does appear to be some very light clear coat wear right here as well. Take a quick look around the edges. Everything is also looking nice. It doesn't look like the finish is necessarily like worn through in that scuffing area we were talking about, so you might be able to polish that out. And that's it for the sides. The back's looking good. You can see when somebody did play it, they must have been a little bit sweaty there, so the finish glows a little bit more. It almost looks like you have some slightly worn clear coat in that area as well. But hey, it still looks pretty good, even under black light. You can't tell that in normal lighting situations. And the back of the neck is also looking good. You don't have any finish worn through there. And same story on the back of the headstock. No breaks, cracks, or repairs. This is just a mighty fine example of kind of an obscure guitar. 
This instrument still retains its original Gibson case. You can see it's got scuffs and some minor Tolex wear. It has a masking tape label, and if you take that off, it's kind of sticky, so I just gotta left those be. But you have two locking latches like this style, and then you have a traditional latch right there and a functioning handle. And the inside is black for this particular case. It's a very shallow case because while well, the body isn't as thick as like a Les Paul, you can definitely see that right there, how it drops down. Then you have a single neck rest, and then the owner added some extra foam in there because he felt the headstock was still too close to the ground, which I would likely agree with. And here's what the top of the case looks like. You've got that little block right there to help secure the guitar down as well. These cases are kind of PRS in style because they have the same little compartment lid right here. And these guitars were so advanced they needed a pre-owner's manual before the owner's manual. So this is actually some really cool case candy to have for this one as you have original flyers for the MV2 and the MV10 and you can kind of see the differences between the prototype examples and the original. These are something I didn't have last time so it's kind of nice to see these. It also tells you the available finishes. So the MV2 only came in candy apple red and antique fireburst finish, whereas the MV10 had antique cherry sunburst, which apparently is different from the fireburst, with the candy apple red and twilight blue finish. I might still grab one of the twilight blues because it's the only color I haven't really super documented. And then just like last time, the traditional owner's manual, which Pretty much tells you all of that, but more in depth with pictures and diagrams. So that's where a lot of the information for this video came from. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this Gibson Multi Voice 2, feel free to check out that link in the description that will take you to the Reverb for Sale ad. Thank you troglodytes for watching, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you on the next episode. Take care. <laughs>